And pastors asked me to preach again April the 7th. Isn't that good? That's not very long. So me and God had it out. I said, now God, you've been laying heavy stuff on me. I've been laying on them people. And we've been laying on your coming. And I did, God, next time I preach, I want to be able to preach on shout. So on April the 10th, whether he says I can or I can't, I'm going to preach something we can shout about. You know I'm joking about that. But I, I think God's going to give us healings and miracles. I mean, I want you to prepare for next Sunday, but April the 7th, I believe the Lord's coming. I believe we're getting ready to get out of here. And I'm going to tell you on the 10th that the ascension's getting ready to take place and we're gone. So likewise, ye, when you see these things come to pass, ye that the kingdom of God, know that ye the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. My subject this morning, you would think it was just maybe for a non-believer but it's for every one of us here, including me. Don't gamble with our souls. Gamble with anything. No, don't gamble with anything else either. Can't say that. But let me emphasize, don't gamble with your soul. Would you grab the person's hand beside you? Would you raise it toward heaven? And would you pray a special anointing on you and on pastor this morning? I would appreciate it. Lift your voices for me. Would you do that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ladies, would you cry out for us? Ladies, would you lift your voice? You know how to birth. Ladies, you know how to give birth. Would you birth a travail here now for God to minister through pastor? Now, men, would you join them with our voices raised toward heaven? Oh, listen to that, God. How happy does that make you, Lord? That's to you, Lord Jesus. Let it be like a Niagara Falls butterfly. In Jesus' name, God bless you. You may be seated. And Sister Teddy, we are praying for you. And we have Tommy at the top of our prayer list. And he is on... Uh, life support in Paris, but he had movement through the night to which we're very thankful for. My faith is not tied to the latest idea. <clears throat> My faith is connected and it is tied to faith. Hebrews reminds us that faith is the substance, not an imagination, nor a fantasy, but it is a substance that will not change. Faith, somebody say faith. faith. Real faith is directly tied to substance. That's why I know I'm saved. My name's been written in the Lamb's book of life. I've obeyed the gospel of the New Testament of Acts 2. I've obeyed the plan. I've been bearing his name. I've been filled with his spirit. I've been born again. I'm happy about that today. That's why I have blessed assurance that if I should die, that I will be immediately in the presence of the Lord. It is a blessed hope. It's more than that. It is a blessed fact. Everybody say a blessed fact. I want to move you just from hope today to fact. I know it to be a Bible fact, and I know in whom I have believed. And there's no doubt about it. I know that I know. Pastor, I would like to tell you something else I know. You probably preached the best message you ever preached last Sunday morning, and I thank God for it. It was a fact. And I'm not going to take a chance on what he preached about. I'm not going to gamble with my soul. I'm not playing games with my eternal destiny. I'm going to make sure that my soul is connected with him today. 
You say, well, you're preaching to a lot of us. Most of us been born again. You're the ones we're preaching to. I'm preaching to myself. I'm preaching to everyone in this room. Because many states in this nation now have turned to gambling to solve their financial woes. That's why America has a $300 billion a year gambling habit. Nevada saw a fourth of its entire budget come from just the city of Las Vegas. And let me tell you, those that are watching that are gamblers with Las Vegas, you're not gonna win. You may win for a while, but there's a reason why all those lights are bright and all those hotels are big, all those casinos are big. It's because the house is gonna end up winning. That was free. I was driving the other day, and of course, please allow me to allow us to have personality in our church, and I'm joking about this, okay? But we were driving home, and I saw that billboard that's right here by my house, and it said 500, and I think it was 84 million. I drove by last night, and it's right at 800 million. And I turned to Mickey, and I said, I wish the Lord would just show me those numbers, and I could give 600,000 to missions, and I'd keep 84. Well, I wouldn't want the organization. I don't think the organization would take my license if I gave them $600 million, but I'm joking about that, Brother Bernard. Just joking about that, Brother Bernard. <laughs> but there's a bigger gambler than what's going on in $600, $700, $800 million right now. It's a gambling addiction in our nation, our state, and our city. But the individual that gambles with their soul, the destiny of your immortal heaven-bound or hell-determined soul is built on your relationship with Jesus Christ. I would not be bishop. I would not be your evangelist or your teacher. I would not be the overseer of the pastor of this church if I failed to warn often of the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Life is short, Marshall 56. Life is short. Eternity is long. Hell is hot and heaven is real. And my message to you is don't gamble with your immoral soul against these Bible facts. Whether I preach it or not, whether you believe it or not, Jesus is coming soon. And I struggle preaching this message. I got the anointing of the Holy Ghost and the only way I could do it is because when I was this tall, my daddy preached this kind of message and he made heaven beautiful and he made hell hot. And I thought Jesus was coming the next day. He didn't, but it doesn't change the fact that Jesus could come any moment and any hour. Some are anticipating tribulation. Let me back up because we have men and Bible studies in this teacher that believe that we're going to go through everything. And if you believe that, that's your choice. You can choose to be wrong if you want to. And I said that jokingly. I'm prepared to go through whatever I got to. I mean, one of my dearest pastor friends was a post-tribulation. We've got a number in the United Pentecostal Church that are post-tribulation. They believe we're going through all the tribulation, but I personally don't believe we're going through the trumpets, the vials, and the seals. I don't believe, except when we come back on white horses, that I'm going to be part of Armageddon. I think that the rapture is going to take place before the trumpets, the vials, or the seals are before Armageddon. I am looking for uh, the mark of the beast not to happen while I'm here. I'm not planning on taking 666 or 777 or 101010. I plan on being in heaven when they're doing all that stuff. Somebody said, are they going to put it up here? And they said, you're going to take a mark in your right hand. Somebody said, well, what if it comes along and you're here? You're going to take the mark? I said, no, I'm not going to take it. But if I'd be stupid enough to do it, I'd tell them to put it in the left hand. And I was joking there. We're living in a day where AI now, I read this this week, this is staggering. Gentry is what you preached last week, this is staggering. AI now is fixing where they can fix your eye. What Gentry preached, a pastor preached last week, and he said, 10 years ago you told me this, I wouldn't believe it. Then 
10 years from now, they are telling us that they will be able to put things in your eyes that you will be able to shop with your eyes and you can say, I want that. And you zero in on that and when your eyes hit that, it notifies the uh, grocery store, they pick it up and they deliver your groceries and they do all that with this AI business that's going on around the world. But when you're a New Testament believer, you're not looking for tribulation and you're not looking for AI and you're not looking for Armageddon, you're looking for one thing. And that's for the trumpet to sound, the dead in Christ to rise first, then we which alive remain shall be called up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The New Testament born again believer is looking for that blessed hope. Paul called it a blessed hope. He called it a purifying hope. He called it hope, hope, hope. And the translation of the rapture and the catching away of the church is very, very near. Someone told me one time, you can't find rapture in the church. And I said, no, you can't find rapture in the church. It's a term that we have that helps us to relate to what's going to happen. But you can find the coming of the Lord in the church. You can find the soon coming of the Lord in the church. And today, what I am going to try to do with his word in the next 30 minutes is allow all of you to wake up to the fact that he's coming and he's coming soon. And he's coming for his bride that's made itself ready ready. The next great event on God's prophetic program is the Lord Jesus Christ appearing in the air and those names that are written in the Lamb's book of life shall meet him there. He's coming as a mother, not you, as a thief. He's coming as a thief. He's not coming as somebody you're going to see it and he's going to knock on all the door. He's coming as a thief. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. He warns us, when ye shall see these things come to pass, us, look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not. This will stand, whether you believe it, whether we believe it, whether you believe it's infallible or not, doesn't change it. Whether the Southern Baptists believe it to be infallible or not, doesn't change it. Whether the Catholics believe it to be infallible or not, doesn't change it. This is the infallible, inerrant word of God. You say that was written and translated by men. That's not what was originally given. Do you think that God would have come to this earth and robed himself in flesh and died between two thieves and allowed something to get to us that wasn't his true, unadulterated, powerful word? No. I first of all stand here today, Clary, there is nothing like this book. Don't let anybody get you out of the book. Don't let anybody shake you about the book. Don't let anybody question this book. These, you can question the United Pentecostal Church Manual. You can question the bylaws of the POA, but don't question the Word of God. I'm preaching His words. Somebody say, I like them red letter words. I like them too, but I like them white letter words too. Uh, thank you, Mother, I'm trying to say that. They're all red letters. This is his word from the opening of Genesis to the end of Revelation. It's all his. Every bit of it, he wrote this. He was from the beginning of time. So I'm pleading with you today, don't wait, don't procrastinate. And to this great church, don't just be going about your business. Get ready. Get ready for soon. The Lord is coming back for his bride that's made herself ready. Luke 12, 45 is a powerful scripture. It talks about the unfaithful servant. Now notice it didn't just talk about the unfaithful person. It talked about a servant, the servant of the Lord. It talked about an unfaithful servant. He said, my Lord delayeth his coming. And what I'm preaching to you great people, that I have the privilege of being bishop up and he has a preacher, the privilege of pastoring is, I know 
you believe in the coming of the Lord. I know you believe in the new birth. The trouble is, do I really know that you think he could come today? Do we really believe that the trumpet could sound and we could be ready today? Do we really understand that the Lord could come get us today? And that's why I will shake. That's why I will holler today. That's why I will get out of myself telling you Jesus is coming and you got to be ready today. That servant wasn't looking for him. I want the Lord. There's something you can do. What can I do for the Lord today? Let him know you're looking for him. I was in a place of business and I was talking with the proprietor and the owner of that business and she was telling me, she's, she's a member of this church, and she said, I just wish the Lord would come today. So I started, started doing a poll since last night at prayer meeting talking to people. Wouldn't it be great? And everyone said, oh, I wish the Lord would come today. It seems like everybody's got a load on them. Everybody, he said, we would feel that in the last days. He said that you would reach a point to where you would be screaming, even so, come Lord Jesus. And all of us has reached that point to where, come on God, we welcome you. It's 1054. If you want to come at 11 o'clock, come on Lord. We want you to know you got a group of people at POA. We got our eyes open. We got our ears sound. We're ready for you to come get the church. Come get the church. Come get the church. He believed, but he wasn't looking for him. Jesus warns, don't be like the foolish virgins. Everybody say foolish virgins. How many? Oh, mother, be quiet. How many of them were there? Oh, 10. Class, you're doing so good. We're going to pass, I think. We're going to move you on to the next grade. How many of them? How many virgins? How many of them were smart and wise? Five. How many of them were unwise? Five wise, five foolish. Everybody say all. Read the Bible. Five wise. Five foolish. Everybody say all. all. They all slumbered and slept. The wise were asleep. That's it. And the foolish was asleep. They were all asleep. Now I'm very thankful for you wise because when he got there, those that didn't have oil, and the key is oil, and you better keep oil in your vessel. The wise were very smart because they not only took their lamp, read it, they also took the vessel with them. That when their lamp got low, they just kept pouring it in. Don't just go with your lamp. Well, here's my, I'm gonna, my little light. Shine, I hide it under a bush. I know I'm going to let it shine. If you don't keep putting all in it, it's going out. You got to keep a vessel there. You got to get to church on Sunday morning. You got to get to that prayer room. You got to talk in tongues. You got to have a relationship with God. You got to get all in your vessel. You got to get all in your lamp. You got to have oil. It takes oil. Keep pouring. What you doing? I'm pouring oil. Why would you come to prayer meeting? I'm pouring oil. Why would you sign the 24-hour prayer sheet? I'm pouring oil. Why am I at church this morning? I'm pouring oil. I got to have oil in my vessel. I got to have oil in my lamps because when he comes, I got to have oil. I'm going to have my light shining. I'm going to have my light alive. I got to have oil. I want the Holy Ghost to baptize us. I want some of you that hadn't had an experience with God in a long time. I want you to have a Holy Ghost experience this morning where you plug in a fresh and new to God and God Almighty oil. So turn to somebody and say, the issue is oil. And at midnight there was a cry made, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And when they went to buy, the bridegroom came and got those that were ready, went with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Now, that's not Old Testament. That's not judgment from one of those Old Testament prophets that's just gone off on somebody. That's the word of the Lord. And the door was shut. And then he says, watch. Would you, would you throw that up there? It's not, a, it's not on mine, but Matthew, if you can do it real quick. Matthew 25, 13. Matthew 25, 13 because there's something I want to show that he tells all of us to do. What's the first two words? 
That's to us that say, that's to those of you that were at prayer meeting last night. That's to those of you that come by this church every day and pray. That's to those of you that's living holy and godly in Christ. That's to all of us. Watch therefore. And the worst thing we can do to insult our God if we are saved, tongue talking Jesus name, our run in holiness, living people, worst thing we can do is not watch for his coming. If you want to please the Lord when you leave here today, you leave saying, God, my bishop woke me up this morning. Forgive me for not looking for you like I should be looking for you. But let me tell you something, Lord, I believe you're coming and I believe you're coming in the twinkling of eye and I'm getting my family and we're getting out of here when the trumpet of God shall sound. That's why in my 54 years of preaching this gospel message is so great of salvation. I've had so many tell me tomorrow. And though, now this is to those of you that's not believers. I've had so many tell me tomorrow. My very first revival, so many things happened. It was in Winfield, Louisiana. Oh, it was Brother Bates so good to me. And I went there, and I've told you this story before. I went there to preach that revival, and I had had all of Mother's notes, and I got all of Daddy's notes. And Daddy's, you couldn't hardly read. Mother's, it was so good you couldn't hardly read. But I would put those notes together, and I went there, and I preached my first message. And I had 57 pages, and I got done in eight minutes. And I gave the altar call and nobody came and Brother Bates got up and, and, and it was my first time ever preaching a message. He got me when I was mowing the yard, I was gonna fly airplanes for Delta. And he got up, he said, Brother Mangan is such a great man. This was his first message. But if, if, if y'all will come back tomorrow night, it'll be a little better, I am sure. <laughs> and uh, so I came home and I told Mother and Daddy, I said, see you later, I'm not coming home tonight. And I went down. And I got behind the old green air conditioning units and me and God had a rendezvous. And I started writing notes and it wasn't but five or six pages, but the next night when I walked to that pulpit, there was an unction of the power of God that began to flow and begin to hit. And when it did, God opened up something and here I stand as your bishop today. That happened from that particular moment. But in that revival, there was a young man standing by. And I mean, I had thrown everything about the second week or the third week of the revival. I had thrown every lure in the tackle box trying to catch his fish. He was loved by the young people, but he had never, ever made a move towards Jesus Christ. And I went back to him <clears throat> and I put my arm around him. And I called him by name and I tried to think of it last night and I couldn't, I knew it then. And I put my arm around him and I said, you know, tonight's your night. And he, he said, you know, um, Brother Anthony said, I, I do feel it's close, but he said, I, I just don't feel like doing it right now. He said, I, I want to do some things. I said, okay. Only for me uh, next day to get a phone call and he was out swimming in the creek and he drowned. And it was in that revival that everything happened to me on my first revival. It changed my life. That's why when I walk here, you say you preach with such passion because I only got one chance at some people in this room. Maybe their only time there at church, I only got one chance. And I'm not gonna walk here with some sermon that I wrote and just did it and prayed over a little bit and then sit here and read it to you and then let's go home and have good lunch and you support this church and we keep supporting missionaries that go home. When I walk to this pulpit, and I think our pastor does the same thing and Pastor Andrew and Pastor Ryan, when we walk to this pulpit, it better be with a passion that there could be somebody in this room that this is their last service and I'm gonna give it everything I got. Don't gamble. Mother, be quiet. Bible, if you gain the whole world and... Oh, y'all know that scripture. See, that, that's, that's, that's why I'm glad you responded. If you gain the... That's the diamonds of Africa. That's the gold. That's everything. I mean, that's, that's if you gained it all and you lose the soul. Oh, how valuable. Don't gamble with it. I'm not going to be much longer because my scripture text and what I've said has really laid out what I'm trying to say. But he said this, this generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled. 
He spoke these words following his parable of the fig tree, which he called the budding of the fig tree. On June the 6th, I'll refer to it again in about five minutes from now. 1967, during the Six-Day War, miraculously the Lord fighting with them. There were jets that flew to you young people. There were jets that flew with the nation of Israel that they said we didn't even have. They had jets flying that Israel had nothing to do with. God had jets flying. God had angels working because he was going to take care of the nation of Israel. And the na nation of Israel took control of Jerusalem in 1948 for the first time since 70 A.D. Whether you believe it or not, that began the generation which Jesus said shall not see these things pass away. For the first sign Jesus gave was, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Notice it was only two years after 1967 when a man walked on the moon for the very first time. The unmanned space exploration in the years since that time has been many of going to the moon. You say, well, that, read your Bible. That's all part of the thing that the Lord talks about he's coming on. He said in Luke 21, 25, he said, and upon the earth there be distress and perplexities of nation, nations and with perplexity of sea and waves roaring and men's hearts failing them for fear for looking after those things which are coming on earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. 500 thousand, excuse me, um, let me back up here. The number one killer, men's hearts fading of fear. I Googled it last night. The number one killer in America, you know what it is? Heart disease. Men's hearts failing them. That just may pass over us, but that, that's a sign that, that he's coming soon. And when I look at the financial disaster, the nuclear war, our nature is so culturally divided. Our nation is so politically divided. I mean, we're hollering at each other. We're screaming at each other. <clears throat> 3.5 million have died from COVID. 500,000 in America alone has died from COVID. With all the ice, the shootings, the weather changes, everything that's happened. Jesus said in Luke 12, 40, he said, be ye therefore ready also for the son of man cometh in an hour when you think not. Israel became a nation in 1948 and there was such a stir. It brought a great revival. People were getting ready for Jesus to come. And in 1967, I was a junior at Louisiana Youth Camp. And Brother Kershaw, many of you may not know him, but he was an Arab man and he spoke very broken English, but oh, could he preach. One of the most handsome preachers you'll ever see. And oh, could he preach. And we had been taught when they cut that barbed wire that the Lord was coming. I mean, people, which the Bible tells us not to do to date it. But when that barbed wire is cut, the Lord's coming. So we were on the back, I was on the back seat, probably sitting with some young lady and probably mother holding her hand. I was just 16 or 17, you know, breaking all the rules. And Brother Kershaw walks out, and it had happened. He didn't do this to scare us. He said, they just cut the bob wire in Israel. Folks, I mean, girlfriend, I went over those pews like they were the hurdles. Because my daddy told me when that happens, that that could be the sign that the Lord was coming. And everybody at that camp just knew, because he had been preaching on it, that the Lord was coming. Churches filled up. I mean, do any of y'all remember that? Churches filled up. People gathered around the nation praying all night. I mean, all denominations, because they felt like Jesus was coming. It was the 67th War. I mean, this was it. And it didn't happen, so we become a little number. How many remember this one? 88 reasons that he's coming in 88. Remember that one? How many sort of got caught up? I mean, be truthful. How, how many sort of read the book and it intrigued you a little bit? Would you raise your hand? Oh, the rest of you are liars. I mean, yeah. Yeah. it intrigued us all. I didn't, I didn't believe it. I, didn't, I knew he could come in 88, but I sure wasn't saying that he was coming in Millions were shaking around the world. Everybody was reading 88 reasons why he's coming in 88. 
And in every one of these cases, it didn't last long. It was there, oh, 88 reasons. Oh, he's coming. Oh, God, I got to get to church. The church was packed out. This was before we moved the back wall. The place was packed out. I said, where, where have all these people been? 88 reasons. He's coming in 88. Oh, God, it could be any day. It could be any hour. And 89 gets here and he hasn't come. So what happens? We move back a little further. Wendy, from the back. The heart becomes a little harder and a little more disbelief sets in. And then, buddy, here's the killer. I'm telling you, on this one, Saturday night prayer meeting had the largest crowd, and there's never been one since. 2000 to YK. Computers are shutting down, lights are going out. Planes are going to quit falling out of the sky. They're going to be falling out of the sky. Don't anybody fly. Shut everything down. It's 2YK. Anybody remember that one? Oh, you got to pray through on that one. <laughs> Folks, and again, our wall was closer. We had chairs. We had chairs down these aisles. I'm telling you, for, for three weeks, we had, we had chairs down the aisle. This place was packed. It was rocking with the presence of God and the glory of God. And, and man, multitudes were seeking God. And churches around the world were filling up, all denominations, because, you know, it's Y2K. Everything's shutting down. Our computers, our, our iPads are going out. We're putting out chairs. And we always prayed that, oh, you're out. Man, that, that New Year's Eve, it was packed and it was rocking. But he didn't come. So we move a little further back to where we finally produced a generation of preachers that are not preaching the second, the rapture of the church. And yes, I'm indicting myself and all you ministers that are watching. We're not preaching the coming of the Lord like we should be preaching the coming of the Lord. Because just because he didn't come in 67, and just because he didn't come in 88, and just become, because he didn't come in Y2K, doesn't mean he couldn't come today. So today is, today is going to be everybody's altar call. It's going to be pastors. It's going to be bishops. It's going to be you, mother. It's going to be all of us. I want us to turn this entire place into just a place where, I'm not talking about your salvation, okay? I'm not talking this in, well, you, you know, you, you don't think, no, I'm talking you're saved, okay? You're saved. Everybody say I'm saved. Those of you that are saved. I'm saved. I'm not talking about your salvation. I'm talking about your watching. I'm talking about you changing your head from like this to doing like this. I'm talking about it doing like this to doing like this. Looking for the coming of the Lord. I didn't know what I could do, Carl. I see you clapping there. You've been so supportive my dad through the years. But it's almost, Dr. Brewer, I feel like I, 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 didn't, I couldn't do it because I, I just didn't know what to do. And I said, well, I may or may not, and I'm just going to do it a little bit. Of it. I feel like Paul Revere. I feel like running through the city and the British are coming. The British are coming. Hey, the British are coming. Paul Revere, the British are coming. Today, I'm running through here. Kenny, thank you for being here again today, buddy. I'm glad you're here. But I'm running through here. I'm screaming. I'm hollering. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. I don't care about Y2K. I don't care about 88 reasons. I don't care what's made you become numb to the coming of the Lord. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Would you get on your feet and would you shout to the Lord with a shout that Jesus is coming? Thank you for that. I hear it. I feel that coming when I preach. I feel that. Good. I feel that. I feel that. I feel that. I feel that. Come now, to your family, 
Last time I let you stand there today, I want everybody in this room, if you love me, you don't have to maybe move but three seats over. But I'm asking everyone that will to the balcony, if you want to come on down, come on. If not, to the front rail. But I'm asking everybody to get as close to this altar. Last time I let us stand as family, but I want to come. I want to come to the altar today. Would you get just as close to the altar as you can today? That's it. Come on down here, just as close as you can. Cam, you can, you can come to the music, and let's just stand together. Just come. Thank you. Look at this crowd coming. Thank you for honoring me today. You're so, you're so sweet to honor what what I am doing. Thank you for coming. That's it. Come on, come as close as you can. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's it. Come as close as you can. That's it. Keep coming. Y'all, would y'all keep moving this way? That's it. They're trying to get down the aisle. Push all the way to you. You go against the person in front of you. That's it. Come on. Look at this. 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 Yeah. Thank you, Balcony. Thank you. I want you to listen to Bishop just a moment. Keep coming. I'm going to wait till you get here. We got time. Keep moving to get us close. You can take that middle aisle if we need to take that middle aisle back there. Those of you need to fill out across that aisle. That's it. Okay. Now, I don't want you, I don't want you touching your family. I don't want you putting your arm around your family. I want you, as God spoke through Holden this morning, I want you, I want you to have your personal encounter, your spot. God spoke through him and said, don't do it collectively today, do it individually. And he didn't know what I was preaching. So today, individually, not your wife yet, not your children, not your grandchildren, but just you. Would you raise your hands and would you talk to God and put yourself in your position? is what I'm talking about. There's an individual revival that's taking place right now. There's an individual, Dwayne, back there, buddy. There's an individual revival taking place. Okay. So go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, boy. Okay. That's it, you. Just you. Nobody else. Just you. Nobody else, just you, get your soul ready. Gamble with everything else, but don't gamble with your soul. Your soul. Your soul. Uh. Many broken this morning that I haven't seen that onion so long. I'm so thankful. That's it, Ray Tate. Go ahead, buddy. That's that fresh anointing. That's that fresh touch. Go ahead. Now put your arm around your family. Put your arm around your friend. If it's man to man, lady to lady. And now we're gonna pray for them and lift your voice right now. It may be your prayer that changes their destiny. Lift your voice right now. Lift your voice right now.
something happening here this morning. Thank you for hearing the word of the Lord. There's an urgency in our prayer this morning. There's an urgency in our prayer this morning. You can feel it. Thank you, church. Thank you for listening to pastor. Thank you for letting us wake all of us up. Thank you for allowing me to wake myself up and to wake you up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus is coming. I'm the Paul Revere for the church. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. So kohala la baha chikina. Se kohala la boho chikara la boho ya. Se kala la mo yo ni la baha ya seke. That's right. Those of you on the web right now, I don't think we've gone off yet. Those of you on the web, let it happen in your room. Let it happen in your home. Let it happen in your automobile. Those of you that are in, you're in church right now, but you're going to be watching this message in the next few hours, the next few days. Let it have a renewed effect on you and know Jesus is coming. Those of you on the web, know Jesus is coming. Know Jesus is coming. Know Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming, and he's coming soon. Now, would you turn to me and do what I always ask? I know you're moved right now. I know you're moved right now, and I know you've done, but would you turn and ask the person beside you, have you been baptized in Jesus' name? Would you do that? Okay. And if they tell you no, listen. Listen to me, those of you that's here, that, those of you that have not been baptized in Jesus' name, listen to me. Oh, listen to me, everybody, just a moment. If you haven't been, time, listen to me. Your soul's at stake. Go get baptized today. If you never come back to this church, if you're in the balcony, if you never come back to this church, well, I was baptized when I was a kid. If it wasn't in Jesus' name, you need to be baptized today. Today, be baptized in Jesus' name. Go get baptized in Jesus. I love you. I love you. Don't let this message slide off. The three things I used, cutting the barbed wire, 88 reasons, Y2K. Don't let this message be dead in three weeks from now. Let this be a change in your lifestyle to where you live. You don't have to just a few things. Just pick up your Bible and start reading it. Start looking for it. Start talking to him every day. Start putting praise music on in your automobile. Start praising him up and down the highways. I love you. You're a great church. Wednesday night's gonna be a great night. And I love being the bishop over you all. And I hope I've served you as best I can serve you because you deserve to be a great, great pastor. And leader. I love you. Go ahead. Like